This video was made using insights from vidIQ. Stick around after the video to find out how we used vidIQ as our secret YouTube weapon while making it. One of the best indicators of how effective a military is, is good logistics. After all, it does not matter how far a weapon can shoot, how fast it can go, or how many soldiers you can put into the field if they cannot be supplied, rearmed, and taken care of properly. The US military has mastered the art of logistics, with a huge domestic industrial base combined with overseas basing, pre-positioning, and forward-deployed replenishment capabilities, the US can sustain combat operations anytime, anywhere. Such logistics prowess has been shown by the US fighting a two-front war half the world away for almost 20 years. Russia, on the other hand, has experienced logistics woes during its invasion of Ukraine. Media and military pundits have frequently bashed the Russian army's poor logistics, but they've yet to really explain why their logistics are so bad. Until now. Before we deep dive into how Russian logistics cannot compare to the US military, Russia has not done everything wrong. One forward-thinking innovation the Russian military has made is choosing smaller vehicles. For example, their primary main battle tanks like the T-72, T-80, and T-90 are about 10 feet shorter and 20 tons lighter than the M1 Abrams. Putting the effectiveness of each tank aside, purely from a logistics perspective this has an advantage. Shorter tanks take up less room inside ships. Lighter tanks also use less fuel when shipping them. And they also make for speedier transport. The Russian Navy has also set itself up for sea access. At the end of World War II, what was formerly known as East Prussia got broken up and mostly absorbed into Poland. However, a tiny sliver of it went to Russia, known as the Kaliningrad Enclave. This tiny portion of Russian territory is crucial in giving Russia year-round access to a warm water port. This is because ports like St. Petersburg or Archangel freeze over during winter, preventing the deployment of ships and submarines. Because Russia desires more warm water ports, this was one of their primary motivations for involvement in Syria. Due to their assistance, Russia obtained perpetual basing rights to Latakia on Syria's Mediterranean coast. Capturing the port of Sevastopol was also a significant factor in the 2014 invasion of Crimea. Because of Russia's need for a more desirable port on the Black Sea, Russia aimed to retake what used to be one of the Soviet Union's primary ports. Due to its steep decline from the port to the sea floor, Sevastopol has been favored as a submarine base for decades and serves as a major logistics hub. But of course Russia has had to violate international law to get Sevastopol, putting the benefits of their generally lighter combat vehicles and aggressive stance at getting warm water ports aside. Russia's military as a whole has failed on the land, the sea, and in the air to provide adequate support for forward deployed units. The most obvious example of Russian failures has been its total lack of sea and airlift capacity. In 1992, just after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russian Air Force had about 500 planes with a combined lift capacity of nearly 30,000 tons. Additionally, the Russian Navy operated about 80 amphibious and logistics ships with enough room to fit over 600 tanks. With fewer than 20 ships and around 100 airplanes left, Russia's forward-deployed combat capacity is just shy of 6,000 tons of gear and about 200 tanks. Such a dramatic decrease in lift capacity severely limits combat operations beyond its borders. Another crucial factor that limits lift capacity is the lack of support for ships and aircraft outside Russian borders. During the Russian campaign in Syria, it was a known deficiency that Russian warships could not resupply their troops in theater. Unlike the US Navy, the Russian Navy does not practice nor even have the capability of regular underway replenishment. Underway replenishment is a method of refueling and re-equipping ships at sea, spearheaded by the US Navy during the First World War. In underway replenishment operations, US Navy and NATO vessels come alongside at distances of about 180 feet from the oiler. One vessel will shoot shot lines over to the other and bring the spawn wire and in-haul outhaul lines over. These then connect the ship to pump fuel and slide pallets of food, parts, supplies, and ammunition between the ships. Though the Soviet Navy had limited capacity for refueling operations and no capacity for taking stores during missions, the Russian Navy has abandoned even trying anymore. Though every US Navy ship regularly conducts underway replenishment, Russian ships do not. Instead, they have to waste time and money pulling into ports to refuel, rearm, and re-equip. The Russian Air Force does not fare much better. Because Russian alienates most of the world, few countries will afford them overflight rights. Overflight is the permission that military planes have to obtain from any country they fly through. If a country says no, that aircraft has to divert to a route that takes them through airspace they are allowed in. 
Thanks to the NATO alliance and friendly relations the US has with most of the world, there are few airspaces that American aircraft are denied overflight, but for Russian planes, their friends are few and far between. Because of this, Russian aircraft supporting combat operations have to take longer routes that waste time, fuel, and money. But even if more countries like Belarus permitted Russian planes to fly through their territory, Russia lacks overseas bases to support their aircraft. Unlike naval aviation which can launch and recover on aircraft carriers, ground-based planes have to have runways. The U.S. has spent the past few decades building relationships that have allowed American aircraft basing rights around the world. The Russian Air Force does not have this luxury. Because of this, with a few exceptions such as Syria and Belarus, Russian aircraft would have nowhere to land unless Russian troops secured overseas bases by force. Another crucial factor to consider is the over-reliance of the Russian army on railways for transportation. Because Russia is so large, with huge territories of virtual wasteland, their military relies more heavily on rail systems than any other European country. The Russians adopted this strategy because during the Cold War they set up most of the USSR and Warsaw Pact countries with a standard wide-gauge track. They did this so in the event of a war they'd always have plenty of railheads to disembark supplies so they would not have to travel too far to forward units. But this logic has a few major flaws. Firstly, the Russians must assume that they'll always control a large majority of their vital rail hubs. Secondly, because of their over-reliance on rail, the logistics units meant to support forward-deployed units pale in comparison to US and NATO units. On average, Western militaries have three to four times the number of logistics personnel as Russia does for servicing equivalent-sized units. Because Russia has not been able to take many population centers, they're stranded in a sort of logistical desert in Ukraine. With no railheads to draw supplies from, the few logistics troops left have to service forward-deployed units in massive truck convoys that depart from the closest rail hubs Russia does control. Usually, these convoys have to leave from Russia or Belarusian territory. Once on the road, these convoys suffer constant attacks from Ukrainian drones and artillery strikes. Additionally, because of the Russian policy of treating its draftees, these often unmotivated, poorly trained, and even more poorly led soldiers are left to service the trucks and vehicles that keep the army supplied. Because of the backwardness, corruption, and hazing in the conscript system, little to no maintenance gets done on these vehicles, which cause a large number of them to be lost before Ukraine can even take a shot at them. Just how bad Russian logistics are at supporting faraway campaigns was studied extensively in a RAND Corporation study in 2020. The RAND Corporation is one of America's oldest and largest military think tanks, and both congressional and military officials frequently cite their reports. According to RAND's own war games, the Russian military would have extreme difficulty supporting formations of troops beyond a brigade level past the borders of Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltics. For any campaigns past Eastern Europe, it's been estimated that Russia could not support units larger than a battalion level. To put these numbers into perspective, a battalion, depending on the military, has around a thousand soldiers, and a brigade usually has several thousand soldiers. This means that anything outside Russia's borders, their military can only ensure battalion-sized units are fully manned, equipped, and supplied. Such a finding has come true in Ukraine, where large Russian formations frequently ran out of fuel, food, water, and ammunition. Why Russia has had a hard time supporting forces outside its borders is not only due to nations not granting them basing rights or their inability to replenish at sea, their own system works against them. In the Russian military, conscripts have always made up most of the fighting force. However, the disastrous wars in Chechnya turned public opinion against the government for deploying conscript soldiers in frontline positions. During those wars, recently conscripted men were rushed to the front and thousands of Russian men died because their government did not care to train them properly. Because of public outrage over conscript casualties in Chechnya, the Duma also passed legislation that made sending conscripts into combat outside Russian borders illegal. Because of this constraint, Russian commanders have difficulty properly manning their battalion tactical groups. Legal constraints before the 2022 invasion saw commanders scrambling to properly man units in time for out-of-area deployments. Oftentimes, soldiers from units in the Far East would have to be brought in to man units in western or southern Russia, preparing to deploy to Donbass or Syria. Because of this dilemma, it's now obvious that part of the reason Putin rushed to annex parts of Ukraine he controlled was so he had the legal basis for sending hundreds of thousands of conscripts he planned to enlist to the front line.
Conscription also hurts Russian logistics because before the invasion, the policy was that conscripts had to primarily serve in support roles. Russian officials gave positions like mechanics, supply clerks, and all the other support roles to conscripts. Taking mechanics as an example, these troops serve a vital function not just in the serving military, but in maintaining stored equipment that, if not taken seriously, can have disastrous effects. In the US military, planes, tanks, ships, and vehicles held in storage receive routine maintenance. Whether provided by contractors or reserve personnel, the US military ensures that equipment held in long-term storage is available for immediate use, if the military ever needs it. The Russian military doesn't work the same way. In principle, Russia also maintains its vast Cold War stockpile of equipment. However, the war in Ukraine has shown that old habits die hard. During the Soviet era, it was common practice to make conscripts maintain and clean equipment. Volunteer soldiers saw these kinds of jobs as beneath them and forced the men who did not want to be there to do it. Of course, this led to work that was done poorly, if done at all. Another way that stored vehicles were improperly maintained was greedy army officers looking to line their pockets. Because Soviet equipment is among the most common gear in a lot of countries' militaries, spare parts are in high demand. Enterprising Soviet officers used to sell parts and pieces from vehicles to make extra money. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russian military did its best to stamp out these practices. During the major Russian army overhaul in the early 2000s, it was reported to Putin that the military had stopped these practices. But it's clear now they had continued. After Russia started taking heavy losses in tanks and armored vehicles, tons of Cold War equipment was dusted off and brought into the fight. Only there was just one problem. A lot of it did not work. Broken equipment and tanks so gutted from the part theft as to be left inoperable have been so prevalent that some reserve tank units reported 90% of their inventories as write-offs. Russian part woes also extend to the crushing sanctions their country has faced since the invasion. Even though Russia boasts a robust arms industry, they relied on abundant imports from Western countries for advanced parts. Everything from microchip processors to advanced optics had to be outsourced to foreign countries. Even though Western countries often import parts too, unlike Russia, it's highly unlikely US supply chains will be interrupted. Even if Russian industry could support its arms needs, the government does not have the money. This is because Russian officials have poured what few defense dollars they have left over into developing wonder weapon type projects like super quiet submarines and hypersonic missiles. Ordinary equipment like gun sights, fire control computers, and communications equipment get left out. The budget constraints even affect the lives of ordinary soldiers to the degree that it hurts combat effectiveness. A hodgepodge of videos coming out of Russia shows that the military does not have the money for even basic things like uniforms, bulletproof vests, and first aid kits. Often enlistment officers tell men to purchase their own gear if they want to survive. Additionally, the soldiers' families are not taken care of. Conscripted men are taken off the street and put on the front lines within weeks or days of their induction. These men leave behind jobs and families that need support. Russian military leadership has said they do not have the money to care for soldiers and their families. Putin directed local government to work out whatever payments they could afford. In some Russian districts, men are given a sheep, and others get several kilograms of fish or some cabbage as payment for their service. Even when they're deployed, soldiers are told they're not being paid a salary and they should just do their job. It is this fundamental difference in how the Russian military pays its soldiers and cares for their families that truly makes the US better than Russia. No matter what, US service members get paid twice a month and get a housing allowance if married or above a certain rank. They get free health care for themselves and their families and a ton of other benefits like money for tuition. The Russian government simply does not have the money or desire to ensure their own troops are properly fed, clothed, and paid. To just show how little Putin cares for his troops, Russia has stopped listing soldiers as killed, but instead as missing in action. This distinction prevents families of Russian service members that the government knows are dead from receiving their life insurance benefits. Ever wondered how we decide what to make videos about? We're going to let you in on a little secret. It's vidIQ. It lets us see exactly how many searches per month a certain keyword gets. More searches means more potential viewers, but of course there's more to it than that. vidIQ also shows you the competition for that keyword. The less competition there is, the more likely that your video will stand out, which means more views for your video. I know, it sounds too easy, but it really is. You don't need to have a genius IQ, you need to have vidIQ. But try it for yourself. Get a 30-day trial for only a dollar by going to vidIQ.com slash the info show. Now go check out how Russian tactics to take over Ukraine will backfire, or click this other video instead.